everyone. This is Amanda Henneberg. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Women's Health Circle along with Cynthia Miller. And we wanted to thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't be together yet, but it's wonderful to see your faces and gather as a community. Um, I'm so proud to be a part of the Women's Health Circle. It's a dynamic group of women that serve as ambassadors to Virginia Hospital Center. And we're hosts for this evening. Um, I'm proud to say that the Women's Health Circle is a philanthropic powerhouse. Just so everyone on this Zoom um, is aware, our annual membership contributions go towards funding a specific women's health area at the hospital. And currently our focus is women's imaging. Um, in addition to our membership contributions, we also organize supply drives throughout the year. And this summer, our members donated blood pressure cuffs and grocery gift cards to the hospital's outpatient clinic for their prenatal care kits, which go to moms with high-risk pregnancies. And stay tuned for more information about our VHC Pediatrics Toy Drive following the presentation. If anybody on this um, forum is interested in learning more about the Women's Health Circle or joining in our work, um, we would love to have you. So please reach out to Colleen Hughes, whose email should be in the chat now, or go to vhcfoundation.com slash WHC. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Lisa Muris. She is a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator. She's been a part of Virginia Hospital Center's Outpatient Diabetes and Nutrition Program for the last three and a half years, where she provides diabetes management education and medical nutrition therapy to patients. So Lisa, thank you so much for being a part of our community forum. Um, and just a reminder to everyone to, again, to echo what Colleen said, um, send any of your questions for the Q&A portion through the Zoom chat, or um, you can email foundation at virginiahospitalcenter.com. Lisa and Chef Prasu will be answering our questions at the very end. So Lisa, I will kick it over to you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really pleased to be here. I actually share um, office space with the outpatient clinic and I know they are very appreciative of all the support from the Women's Health Foundation. So if we could just go ahead and share my slides. I wanted to start kind of on a micro level. Um, you know, nutrition is such a broad topic. Um, so I wanted to kind of drill down a little bit and talk about something that's probably familiar for most of you, and that's the Nutrition Facts label. So the Nutrition Facts label is basically a tool, a tool that we can have in our toolbox to help evaluate products. We're gonna see that on many packaged foods, things that you might buy at the grocery store. And I've got an example on the screen of what I'm gonna to refer to as the old Nutrition Facts label, which you see there on the left, and the newer Nutrition Facts label there on the right. Now, the compliance date for the new label was just this past January. Um, it actually originally was supposed to come out in 2018 and kind of got pushed back for a few years. But you may have already been noticing it. You may have seen that many manufacturers had started using this newer label. And again, that's the one to the right. So it was the larger manufacturers that are, are first going to need to put that on their products. And then within another year or so, we'll see some of the smaller manufacturers um, adding that label to many of their products. When you take a look at it, there's probably a couple different things you'll notice. Um, I know for me, the font size kind of stood out right away. Um, you know, that, that calories really jumps out at you right now and the serving size as well kind of hard to read that on the older label so critical information can be found on the nutrition facts label um, we always want to take a look at that serving size that's important because everything below that serving size um, is, is going to be based on that quantity there so in this case our serving size is two-thirds of a cup Depends on the product as to whether you might think this is a big serving or a small serving. Um, I would probably argue if it was something like breakfast cereal, this might be kind of a small serving. I know two thirds of a cup probably wouldn't even go halfway in many cereal bowls. Um, but some other products you might consider this to be pretty adequate. Um, another thing that you'll notice on this newer label, which I think is really good information for all of us, is the addition of added sugars. 
And you're going to find that down towards the bottom there under the total carbohydrates. So in the past, if you look at the previous label, we had sugars, but we didn't know whether it was an added sugar or more of a refined sugar or if it was a natural sugar that was coming from something like fruit or milk. Now we have a differentiation. So we can tell there on that newer label that this product has 12 grams of sugar, 10 grams of which are added sugars. Now added sugars are something that the manufacturer has added during processing. So it can be something that in many cases is just extra calories. It's nothing that's providing nutritional value. Um, natural sugars, things such as fruit and milk are gonna provide us with many important nutrients. So this is really good information. We can really break that down and decide if this is gonna be a good choice for us. I've got a um, product I found in my cabinet. Um, this is a Cliff Bar. And if I take a look at the nutrition facts label on this one, this particular product has 19 grams of sugar, 18 of which are added sugars. And then if I go and take a look at the list of ingredients, I'm going to see brown rice syrup, I'm going to see cane syrup, I'm going to see barley malt, all different names for sugar. So it really, again, gives us some good detail um, as to whether this product would be something that we might want to um, choose when we're at the grocery store. Um, it's estimated that Americans take in a lot of extra sugar, so that can be a good way to, to determine if this is something that's going to add too much sugar to our diet. The other thing that we'll notice with the new Nutrition Facts label was a little bit more realistic serving sizes. You might have seen something such as a can of soup, where there was two servings per container, and that's not always realistic. A lot of times we might be having that entire can of soup. Um, so this is going to give you both options. It's going to show you that if you actually had the one cup serving here, this is what the calories are, this is what the sodium, et cetera. But if I had that whole can of soup, this is what the total container is going to be. So a little more real world type of nutrition information there for us. That could be something like a can of soup, a pint of ice cream, which you know in many cases might be one serving as well. So again, making those labels a little more realistic and a little more true to the way people actually eat. So now we've got a little bit of information about the nutrition facts. We've got a tool in our toolbox that can help evaluate some of those um, information that we're looking at. Let's talk a little bit about the grocery store, um, you know, where we're going to buy one of those products. So I know early on in the pandemic, grocery shopping was a, a bit of a harried situation. You know, we had all the um, hoarding going on and um, things of that nature. Gotten a little quieter now, but maybe many people are, are still concerned about shopping safely. So just a few tips here for you. Um, many grocery stores are putting markers on the ground, kind of reminding us to keep social distance, at least a cart length apart. I think in general, we want to try to minimize the amount of trips that we take to the grocery store. Um, you know, it was probably in the past where you'd pop out and get some bananas if you were, had run out of those, you know, maybe even go to the grocery store a couple times uh, a week, maybe even a couple times a day. Now we're trying to minimize that um, just for safety reasons. And I think nutritionally speaking, you know, the, the more often we go, the more likely we might be able to make some of those impulse purchases that sometimes can be that junk food. Um, obviously, we want to wear a face covering, try to keep our hands away from our face. And I don't know about you, but that's been a, a real eye opener for me. How often I, I seem to be wanting to touch my face. Um, you don't need to wear gloves. Um, I see this a lot with some of my patients that kind of have this false sense of security of wearing gloves. Um, to properly wear gloves, you need to be changing them frequently. And a lot of people don't do that. They wear the same pair of gloves all day and you're just kind of carrying those germs from one place to another. So you don't need to wear gloves. It's really more important to practice that good hand hygiene um, and, and keep those hands clean. Shop quickly, be efficient, you know, want to kind of get in and get out and lower the risk as much as we can. And then finally, if you feel better disinfecting your grocery items, you certainly can do that. I would just take care to make sure if you're using something like bleach wipes that you don't actually wipe something that you're going to eat or ingest later on. So we want to take a little care with that and just think about what we're wiping down and making sure that's going to be safe. You can advance to the next slide. Thank you. Um, if you don't feel comfortable grocery shopping, we certainly have a lot of delivery options. Um, I have many patients that are immunocompromised or, you know, have some comorbidities that put them at pretty high risk. So they are trying not to go out very often and they're, they're using delivery services to have their groceries brought to them. Um, Instacart, you know, is a great thing. You can get our groceries delivered along with many other items. We have Amazon Fresh. We have Postmates. And then most grocery stores are going to have some of those services either delivering to our home 
or even going um, to pick it up out front doing that curbside service. We still want to practice good hand hygiene. You know, one con I would say about grocery delivery services is that you're introducing another person to the equation. You know, you've got another delivery personnel in there. So we do want to try to make sure we're washing our hands. We do want to practice that social distancing from the delivery personnel, just like we would do if we were actually going into the grocery store as well. So a couple things to keep in mind with that. Um, we talked a little bit about the nutrition facts labels, and now we know what to look for in that grocery store. Let's talk a little bit about having some of those healthy items on hand. If we're trying to minimize the amount of time we're going to the grocery store, one thing to think about is having a really well-stocked pantry, having those items on hand so that we can make a quick and healthy meal. I know Pursue is gonna talk a little bit about some of those um, cooking techniques and I'm looking forward to seeing that. And I think it's a good idea to have some of these items on hand when maybe you don't have a recipe to follow. I'm a huge fan of canned beans. Um, beans are a great source of plant protein, very high in fiber. Um, there's a lot of varieties. And of course we wanna try to choose those lower sodium versions of beans when we can. Um, if not, rinsing them off can be a good way to reduce that sodium by about a third. Canned tuna, canned salmon, you know, really any of those types of um, canned fish can be a good healthy protein option and trying to pick ones that are canned in water versus oil just to lower the calorie content. Brown rice um, or, or any other types of whole grains um, can be a good option to have on hand. Um, and there's nothing wrong with having something like a pre-cooked version such as the, the Uncle Ben's um, whole grain brown rice. That, that's certainly something that can be a quick and easy thing to throw together for dinner. Um, whole grain pasta, you know, there's a lot of different types there, and you might have seen some of the lower carb versions made from um, different types of chickpeas, edamame, black bean. Um, that can be a good way to get in some extra protein um, along with some of the, those um, higher amounts of fiber. Chicken, vegetable broth, really good ways of starting a meal, maybe a soup or a chili or using them, um, you know, in cooking. Again, trying to choose the low sodium version so we can just keep the, the amount of salt in our diet to a minimum. Canned tomatoes can be a good option. You know, can use those in a variety of different recipes. And it's kind of a better idea to buy the whole tomatoes so we can chop them up if we need to or puree them, just giving us a little more flexibility. Uh, tomato paste can also be another good option for creating a meal. And then thinking about some of those shelf stable vegetables, um, potatoes, squashes, getting into fall here. So maybe we're starting to think about those winter squashes. Those can be a great option um, to, to have in your pantry, you know, to make something for dinner or even lunch um, as we're working from home and spending more time at home. Go to the next slide. Great. Thank you. Um, fridge and freezer, let's not forget that. We want to have some of those lean proteins on hand, chicken breast, ground turkey, uh, pork tenderloin, um, lean ground beef, um, fish. Those can all be good protein options. Having frozen vegetables, um, maybe many of you kind of gear more toward the fresh vegetables and that can certainly be an option, but it's really a good idea to have some of these frozen vegetables in your freezer for making a quick and easy meal. Um, those are something that, that will have a long life and we can certainly grab something and, and put it in the microwave or throw it in the oven to roast with some other vegetables for a good healthy dinner. Same thing with frozen fruit it can be a good option for smoothies, having with breakfast, you know, certainly having those frozen fruits and vegetables on hand can be a good, good thing. Eggs can be another good source of protein, um, you know, limited prep time on those. So they can be a good go to food and then ways of just sort of punching up those meals, thinking about things like lemon and lime juice, fresh herbs. Um, and then some of those other mm -hmm. vegetables that might have a longer shelf life, like carrots, calorie, uh, celery, cabbage. Um, as well as that, that fruit, such as apples, oranges, and melons. All good things to kind of have on, on that well-stocked um, refrigerator or countertop. And then finally, thinking about ways to add a little more flavor to those recipes. Um, you know, there's a lot of fancy vinegars out there, but having just a basic red wine, white wine, or balsamic vinegar can be a nice, nice one to have on hand. Having some of those, um, you know, heart-healthy oils, like olive oil, canola oil, and then having some other flavors, you know, to, to really add some punch to your recipes, soy sauce, mustard, salsa. I know Pursue is going to give us some good tips on herbs and spices and things that we can use in recipes, but always having a good spice rack can be a nice way of uh, adding a little more interest to those meals. 
So all of these things are things that we can have on hand. And um, this might be something Colleen can share with the group um, later. I know it's a lot of detail and information on here, but I think having a, a good well-stocked pantry can certainly be an option for us, um, making sure that we've got some of those items on hand to make a healthy meal. Um, as we're spending more time at home, we might be thinking that, oh, I should be doing a lot of fancy cooking. I should be spending a lot of time making, you know, gourmet meals for my family. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. It, it can be certainly something very simple. As you're doing some meal planning, I would encourage you to first think a little bit about vegetables. You know, we really want to try to encourage our, our patients, um, and I certainly would encourage you to build your meals off of vegetables. So first thinking about what are some vegetables I can add this week? Am I going to want to go toward those winter squashes, or am I thinking more broccoli? Am I thinking perhaps I'll, I'll try something new? And then adding your proteins um, and perhaps some carbohydrates from there. Um, we wanna generally make our plate about 50% vegetables. And if we start with our meal planning by building that plate off of vegetables, it can make us more successful. And then finally, I'll just wrap up by talking a little bit about you know, sort of balancing nutrition and um, the current pandemic. There's a lot of things to feel stressed about. Um, I had a patient the other day who was telling me, he was watching the debate on Tuesday night, and he said, you know, I just turned it off and I went and got a piece of cake, which I think is um, certainly a reaction that many of us have. I think a lot of us were turning more to alcohol, but uh, that could certainly be something that we might do as well. So trying to be gentle with yourself. You know, we're gonna have days where we turn off the TV and we get a piece of cake, and, and that's just the way it goes. Um, I think having a game plan, I think having a well-stocked pantry can certainly, you know, take some of that stress off by knowing, you know, you know, being organized and having a game plan can make us feel a little bit better. But being gentle with ourselves is certainly a big part of it. And then thinking about some ways of, you know, managing the stress that we have that maybe isn't turning to some of those comfort foods. You know, thinking about things like exercise, thinking about things like prayer, meditation, uh, music maybe calling a friend or family member and using those as more uh, stress management techniques versus kind of turning to the ice cream or, or jumping into the cake every time. Um, it is a stressful time and we, we certainly can find comfort for many of those foods. But I think just like we have some of those tools for evaluating nutrition and for um, you know, making decisions at the grocery store, we also want to have some of those tools for managing our stress and, and finding different ways of dealing with you know, the current situation. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Amanda again. It was a pleasure speaking with all of you, and I'll see you back with the Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. We really appreciate it. Um, just a reminder, Lisa will be back to answer your questions after the recipe demonstration. So make sure to put any questions in the chat box. Um, I would now like to turn it over to our next guest, Chef Prasu Mehta. Um, she is going to be um, taking us through some recipes and a uh, cooking demo. So I will kick it over to her now. Hello, everyone. Hi. This is Prasu Mehta, and I hope everyone can hear me. I am a educator, a lifelong cook, a chef, a culinary instructor, and I am so happy to be here today. Thank you to the Virginia Hospital Center. I have been teaching cooking classes for many years now. I've taught everyone from vegans to carnivores, professionals to novices. And I couldn't agree more with everything Lisa just said about how we want to stock our pantries and our fridges so that we can continue as this goes on to really feed our families the best that we can with healthy, nutritious, delicious meals. So today I actually have a recipe for all of you and actually some additional bonus recipes that will be included later. Um, and it will be for uh, a recipe that I developed for something called farro risotto. And I hope you all enjoy that. And I'll be happy to answer questions at the end and also follow any follow-up questions that anyone may have. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm Prasu Mehta with Classic and Modern Cooking, and I'm so glad to be here today. I'm going to be teaching you two different dishes that are one-pot meals that are versatile and delicious. The first one is something I created called farro risotto, and there's a lot of different ways you can 
go about it, but the first thing is to start with a little bit of butter in a medium, a medium heat in a pan. And then I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil and let that warm through. While we're waiting for that to warm up, and if you have a, a Dutch oven, that's great. If not, you can use a different kind of pan as long as it's big enough to hold everything, you should be good to go. In this dish, you can use a couple of different things, but we're definitely going to use garlic. And you can use red onion or a shallot, which is what I'm going to use today. Move it around the pan a bit. The butter is melting into the olive oil. The reason I put butter and olive oil together is because that raises the heat um, and the cooking temperature. So butter alone would burn a lot faster. And also, it tastes really nicely together in this dish. I'm going to put a little bit more shallot in there. <laughs> Okay, mm, that's starting to smell good already. And I'm going to, while I make sure the heat is not, it's really important to make sure the heat is medium, not too high. So nothing burns in here. That's particularly important when we put the garlic in because once the garlic burns, you'll have to start over again. You can't really, really revive it. So I want to chop your garlic really finely so it just kind of melts in that butter. and. The more you practice chopping skills, the faster your knife will go. You're just going to run your knife through really fast. This knife is very sharp, um, and it, the sharper the knife, actually, the, the safer it is, believe it or not. I've been trying to teach my kids how to chop quickly so that they can help get some meals on the table, and it's been great because that's a little bit less work for me. <laughs> and that's pretty good right there. That's, that's what we want, a fine, very fine mince. Now, I won't tell anybody, if you're really tired and you find yourself unable to chop and you use something that's already chopped, that's okay. We'll not come over to your house and harass you about it. But everybody you know, has to take a short cut once in a while. That's fine, especially these days. That's how it goes. So that's perfectly acceptable to do what you need to do. Although I'm not going to lie, it tastes better if you use fresh garlic that you just chopped yourself. <laughs> so we're going to let that go. And again, we really, really don't want this garlic to burn. So I keep moving it around the pan. It's already starting to smell great in here. There aren't too many dishes that don't end up being great, starting out with shallots, butter, garlic, and olive oil. <laughs> okay, so this dish is something that I invented over time that can use a bunch of different ingredients. But today I'm going to be using um, mushrooms, and these are baby bella mushrooms, and then also pancetta and uh, farro. It's really important that mushrooms in there, that you use farro that is not the, the kind that's, that needs to be soaked overnight. You can do that, but then it'll take a long time to cook. So you want to make sure you get the kind, and I'm going to show you right now, that's already par-cooked or pre-cooked. And this is what farro looks like for anybody who wasn't sure about it. It's an ancient grain. It's been around forever. It's really healthy. It's a great substitution for just regular rice, which, of course, we love. But it's nice to mix things up once in a while. But I'm going to go ahead and put that down for a minute and then get get those mushrooms in here. And you can, again, if you're not a huge fan of mushrooms, I understand that you know, I happen to like everything. My husband is indifferent to mushrooms. <laughs> different, different people like different, different things. things. If, if you, you want to change this, this you, you could, could do, do you could do a different vegetable. You could do like maybe some zucchini or maybe like a little bit of um, what else would be good in here? Maybe um, even like a, a bit of chopped carrot or something like that. There's definitely different flavor combinations that we can put in. But this is this is starting to get where we want it to be. You see how it's it's just kind of browning? I'm gonna let that brown a little bit more though. Okay. All right, while we let that brown, let me show you. I'm going to in a minute put this in the 
this is some diced pancetta, which is like the Italian bacon, if you aren't familiar with it. You can either dice it yourself or you can get it pre-diced. That's up to you. And it just adds a nice flavor. It has a little bit different flavor than, than bacon, but it's, it's a similar idea. So you could also use bacon. And if you don't eat any of those things, you can leave it out altogether. It's, it's up to you. I'm going to go ahead and add pancetta in the pan. Mm. It was important to like, let this just kind of hang out for a couple of minutes and just brown up nicely before we add other ingredients to it. At this point, I'm going to add just a little bit of salt. I use kosher salt because it actually does a little bit less sodium. Salt plus the taste. As you can see here, I did not put a lot of salt, but really important that you salt your food while you're cooking because salting it afterwards will surely increase the salt that you, that you put in. When a lot of people don't always understand that. And if you put no salt in your cooking, not only will it not taste very good, it will actually create a higher sodium content later on. So if you're just able to get exactly that, that pinch of salt the way it should be, and or whatever the recipe calls for, then you cooked it from scratch, it tastes great, you won't even need to add anything to it. It's great. Go ahead and add some pepper too. Freshly ground is best if you have it, but you certainly can just have some already ground pepper. So this, this pan conducts heat nicely. If you have another pan like this and it's maybe going a little bit faster, just reduce your heat. And of course, if you have an electric stove, then adjust your heat accordingly. But what you really want to start seeing are these bits getting really nice and brown like that. Very yummy. Mm. Okay, the next step is I'm going to go ahead and add the farro in here. If you want to, you can let this go a little bit longer, but I think it's a nice, it's a nice where you can still lift it out of the pan, but it's not turning to. And this process right here is called rendering, and you're rendering the fat out. If you feel like maybe it's more, you can always spoon out a little bit of the fat, but I'm going to tell you, it's really delicious, <laughs> and it's going to make everything else taste really good. So I would just leave it in there because it's not that much. I'm going to go ahead and add the farro. There's a lot of great brands of farro out there. Just um, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you can see a, very, a whole variety of them. As long as it's the pre the part of time, then you'll be in good shape. Okay, I think that's enough. So cool. All right. So. Now, this is the key thing. We want to get on and in, absorb what's going on in here, and then make sure that this farro begins to toast in the pan. It's picking up all the bits on the bottom, all of that, that flavor. And I change this recipe up often. Sometimes I go in a different direction. I might even use spices or something that kind of gives it a different flavor profile. But today, I'm sticking with them. I guess it's, it goes, favors an Italian profile. Um, okay, I'm gonna let that toast up just a little bit. Make sure it's evenly spread. Now, this is the key thing. You want to get on it and absorb what's going on in here, and then make sure that this farro begins to toast in the pan. It's picking up all the bits on the bottom, all of that, that flavor. And I change this recipe up often. Sometimes I go in a different direction, and I might even use spices or something that kind of gives it a different flavor profile. But today, I'm sticking with them. I guess it's, it goes, favors an Italian profile. Um, okay, I'll let that 
sound just a little bit. Make sure it's evenly spread. I'm just going to put the lid on there for just a minute. Let it steam a little bit. It's toasting up nicely. It's got a real nutty flavor, and you can see that just after just a couple of minutes, those bits that are on the bottom, that's actually what you want to see. Because in a minute, we're going to deglaze this pan, and deglazing just means putting in the liquid to get the bits off the bottom. And those add so much flavor, it's really important that you get every last bit of it. Okay, now, I'm going to go ahead and add the liquid now. You could add a couple of different liquids if you're, you know, if you're out of something. I use some bone broth, and it really does have a nice good, good layer of flavor in there. You could also add a splash of wine, you could even just use water. You can, you can do a bunch of different things. I think the most, the biggest optimum boost of flavor is when I've been using the bone broth, which I make, but you can certainly buy it. It's up to you. This is chicken. Um, you could keep this entire dish vegetarian and leave out the pancetta and use a vegetable broth if you want to. But this is going to make, if you want to hear this really awesome crackling sound. And you want enough in there to Maybe a couple of times. Okay, so now, now you can see how we have, hmm, we have gotten all those bits up. It's come to a boil, and it's going to, it's going to take a few minutes for this to, to cook through. All right, we're going to let this thing hang out a little longer. Go. Okay, this has been cooking for a few minutes now, probably about seven minutes or so, and we're going to see how it's doing. Ooh. What's nice about this is that all the mushrooms and pancetta are still really intact, and they're just all flavoring each other, and it's going to make it taste really nice. Now, at this point, you could, honestly, you could, you could just eat this like this if you really wanted to, but I like adding a, a couple of other layers of flavor. And it's important that you take it off the heat, which I've got to do, just to let it, you know, it, it'll cook a little bit better. It's gonna, it should take about 10 minutes at least to cook if it's the, if it's the pre-cooked variety. If it's not, then again, then you're going to have a long time <laughs> that you have to wait. Okay. Go ahead and move this over. And what I do is... Just go ahead and add a creamy element to it, which is really nice. Um, again, if you're avoiding those kind of things, that's fine. You are welcome not to add this, but I'm going to add a little bit of a couple of different cheeses. So I've got here mascarpone cheese, and I'm going to put in about just a spoon of spoon in there. And then I also have some honeyed goat cheese. And these two together, I find, just add a really nice... Again, you can suit this to your taste and see how, how you like it. I'm just going to work that through here. I took it off the heat just in case it's not quite, I mean, it's hot enough as it is, but just, just to get it off the, so you could, it's adding all this creaminess in here. Mm. Smells good too. Okay, make sure you want to get all of it. So I think that I would probably add a little bit more just to make sure all of it is nicely coated. And what's nice about this too is that you can put the lid on it and let it sit and make it a little bit ahead of time and then it'll, it'll get even fluffier. So it has a nutty flavor from the toasting, but then it gets fluffy just while you're waiting to eat. Another thing you can do is just put the lid back on and let it melt in there, kind of do its work. And here you have it. This is my farro risotto. I've garnished it with some flat leaf parsley and a little bit of chive, and you could garnish it with whatever herbs you have. Um, sometimes I use thyme right here, actually, and 
and then you just pull the leaves off. And And this is actually delicious warm, but you can even serve at room temperature or cold as a salad the next day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chef Prasu. That was a great demonstration. We really appreciate it. We all learned a lot. So thank you so much thank for you. doing that. Um, so now we are going to open it up to um, some Q&A. And we have um, a couple questions already in the chat box. So I'll go ahead um, and, and read them. And either one of you can answer based on who is probably best to see, uh, best for that topic. So the first question is, can you discuss the RDA of sugar? Um, Lisa, that might be best for you. Sure, yeah. Um, th there's not really a, a recommended daily allowance for sugar. Um, there's a, if you're talking about added sugar in particular, there's a couple of different recommendations. Um, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend that we keep our added sugar intake less than 10% of our daily calories. Um, so, you know, if you were on, um, kind of to use an example, I guess a 2000 calorie diet, you know, it'd be about 10% or, or 200 calories from added sugar in your diet there. Um, so it kind of depends on your size, depends on, you know, whether you're, um, you know, a big person, a small person, how old you are, you know, what your calorie allowance would be. Um, the American Heart Association kind of goes a little bit more um, general and recommends that men keep their um, intake of added sugars to nine teaspoons or less per day and women about six teaspoons um, or less per day. Um, so the, there's about, um, you know, one teaspoon is equivalent to four grams of, of added sugar so that you can kind of use that as a way of, you know, converting the teaspoons to grams. Um, I guess, you know, kind of the big thing about it, since there isn't really a lot of benefit from things like added sugar, as I said before, we're not getting any nutrients, it's just extra calories in our diet. Um, they generally want to try to keep it to a minimum um, and, and kind of, you know, think about what the added sugar in our diet is coming from. Is it coming from some things that don't necessarily need a lot of sugar? Um, if you take a look at nutrition labels, you'll see things like ketchup and barbecue sauce and spaghetti um, sauce have added sugar in them. And so there might be areas where you want to really minimize the amount of sugar that's been added to those products when you're choosing them um, and, and kind of save um, some of that sweetness in your diet, maybe for a you know, piece of chocolate or something that you enjoy a little bit more um, versus just some of those empty calories. Um, so yeah, it kind of depends a little bit on your size as to what you want to stick to for added sugars within your diet, but I think kind of the bottom line is trying to keep it to a minimum for most of us. Great, thanks. Um, the next question is, would you comment on dietary supplements, specifically calcium supplements and memory enhancing supplements? Yeah, so um, calcium supplements have kind of kind of gone, I guess, a little bit out of favor. There was some research uh, linking calcium supplements to an increased risk of kidney stones. Um, so it was generally recommended that most women, um, you know, take a calcium supplement. Um, but then again, the research was showing that that was increasing that risk of kidney stones. So we don't see that quite as much. Um, I do see many people taking vitamin D supplements now, um, which of course works with calcium um, to help with our bone health. Um, you know, I'm a dietitian, so I, I always kind of say, let's try to get a lot of those um, things from food rather than take it in a pill. Um, the other thing to remember with supplements is that they are not regulated um, by the FDA. So we never really know if that's actually what's in that, you know, bottle of, of calcium or vitamin D or whatever it might be. So I think trying to get it from food um, is, is definitely a good strategy. And then if you really are falling short, then you might want to talk to your doctor about a supplement. Um, memory enhancing, um, you know, I'm not really aware of any kind of supplement you can take. I would say some foods that have been linked to brain health are some of those foods that are a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, which is going to be um, uh, something we would often find in things like fatty fish, like salmon, um, trout. It's going to be something we would find in some of those um, healthy oils like olive oil, canola oil. Um, you know, avocados, um, all of those have, have been shown in some research to help improve our brain health. 
Um, and then there's also been some indications that sources of caffeine like coffee or tea can also, you know, help with, um, you know, memory and, and being a bit sharper cognitively as well. Um, so, you know, I think, again, trying to look to the foods first um, can be a, a good way to go. And then if you feel like you really, your diet is not that varied, you can talk to your doctor about whether a supplement would be appropriate. Okay, great. And um, this Next question is probably going to be for Chef Prasu. Um, we have one person who says, uh, my pantry is stocked with dry beans and other, um, and, and other than using them for soup, I'm stumped about how to use them. Do you have any <laughs> recipes or Absolutely, things to yes. dry beans too? Sure. In fact, I have dried beans sitting in my pantry right now, too, um, because, you know, they're great to keep around, um, along with canned beans and any kind of bean. Um, of course, you can always make soup, like you said, but there's there's different chilies. There's an interesting recipe I made not too long ago for cannellini beans called cannellini beurre blanc, which is basically making a uh, it's a it's using some of the the bean liquid which is called aquafaba if you have it in a can but if you can actually retain the liquid that you soak your beans in which you would need to do if you have dried beans usually overnight and then you can it involves adding like a little bit of vinegar a little bit of butter and some herbs and actually tossing it with pasta it sounds unusual but if anyone has any questions about it i can always send the link to a recipe um, and then of course dips and um, anything to do with, you know, obviously, I would sometimes my kids will want something really quickly and nachos are always a great idea for any kind of bean. And um, even if you really want to get creative, you can, you could um, make a, you can make certain dals, which is, a, which is like usually an Indian lentil dish out of actual regular beans. And instead of using the lentils, and even you could make, um, patties like some kind of like a like a veggie burger or something mixed in with that to give some variety so there's a lot of different things you can do with beans and they're a great thing to keep around great thank you um i'm going to combine these next two questions um well, i have a question about um sugar in relation to having breast cancer does it feed the cancer and should it be eliminated or just watch excess sugar intake? And then my question that I asked actually I'm gonna tack on here, I kind of was also wondering about soy and that same kind of group, you know, you read that women shouldn't be eating a lot of soy for that similar reason. So I guess sugar and soy and how, it, does it feed cancer? How does it go from there? Yeah. Um I would say it's a case where, where uh, sugar in your diet is going to feed cancer. Um, you know, obviously cancer cells need a source of energy and that energy could be coming from any type of food that you're eating. Um, I, I think the, the risk really more with sugar and, and links to breast cancer is with um, obesity because we, we do know that um, individuals who are carrying some extra weight, um, overweight or obese, are at a higher risk for breast cancer, that there's actually been some link between that and um, a higher risk for breast cancer. So, you know, a lot of times when we have extra sugar in our diet, you know, it can certainly lead to weight gain. Um, I would say the other thing that some of the research has shown is that um, too much sugar in someone's diet can also... Um, increase inflammation in the body. Um, and so that can be an increased risk for things like breast cancer and other types of cancer as well. Um, so I wouldn't say, you know, it's something that, you know, I've had a lot of sugar and it's making my cancer worse because again, cancer cells are, you know, certainly gonna, you know, thrive on just energy in general. Um, but in terms of risk for cancer is that, you know, certainly having too much sugar in our diet could increase our risk because of some of those other factors such as, you know, obesity or um, increasing the risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, with soy, so actually some of the research has shown that soy intake can be somewhat protective um, for risk for breast cancer as well as some other reproductive cancers like um, endometrial cancer. Um, th there was some link between, you know, soy has sort of those that is estrogen, you know, mimicking um, type of receptors. So it, it was kind of thought that that's going to help, you know, increase the risk for cancer. But a lot of the research now is showing that that's not the case. Um, so I, I think it's generally um, been shown having soy in your diet can actually be protective. It can be a good thing to have, um, you know. Um, 
most of the studies have shown having more products that are um, less processed. So doing something like tofu um, in your diet versus, you know, maybe a granola bar that has soy added to it. So it, it's shown that the, the less processed product is, is really more beneficial. And then obviously we get other benefits from having um, things like tofu in our diet because it can be a good source of protein and low in saturated fat and, and many of those other benefits. So I think having soy is certainly fine. Um, most of us are probably not going to eat, you know, so much that it would really, you know, cause any issues as far as risk for cancers, um, either breast cancer or reproductive cancers. Um, and again, can be certainly a good healthy choice of, of protein, whether it's, um, you know, things like tofu, edamame, um, you know, any of those types of products can certainly, you know, fit into a well-rounded diet. Great. I did not know that about soy, so that's good to know. Um, <laughs> Uh, could you talk about calcium and food absorption, i.e. what would stop natural absorption? Um, the absorption of calcium. So a lot of times, you know, when we're thinking about the way we absorb vitamins, um, you know, Mother Nature is pretty smart and, and pairs it with things that help us absorb it, it better a lot of times. So we tend to absorb calcium well when it comes in a source of vitamin D, which is oftentimes we're going to find in dairy products. Um, so having those two together, and, and I think, you know, whether it's, you know, cow's milk or whether it's even something like almond milk where, you know, it's been fortified with, with uh, calcium and vitamin D generally will help with the absorption um, as, as well as possible. And again, that sort of relates to the earlier question of supplements that we do tend to absorb whole foods better because, again, you know, they're packaged in such a way that that um, absorption, that bioavailability is much better. Um, when, when they come from a more natural source versus a more processed source that we're going to find um, in a supplement there. Okay, great. And two more quick questions that we're trying to fit in. Um, how much fiber should we be getting in our daily diets, natural fiber versus a supplement? <laughs> Yeah, so the recommendation for fiber is um, 25 grams a day for women and 38 grams for men. Um, and again, that kind of goes back to size. Men are generally a little bit bigger um, than women. Um, we get all fiber from plant foods. So the recipe that Pursue just demonstrated um, had a lot of really good sources of fiber, you know, um, the farro, the mushrooms, um, you know, those are all going to be ways that we get plenty of fiber in our diet. So thinking of those plant foods, um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, you know, those are all going to be the primary sources of fiber as well as nuts and seeds and, and some of those other things that maybe we are having as toppings or snacks um, are going to be good sources of fiber. Um, and, you know, if, if you really try to include those, I was mentioning earlier about trying to make your plate mostly vegetables, that's an easy way to kind of increase your fiber, you know, um, really starting to fill up on those vegetables, adding some of those whole grains, um, that can be a way to make sure that we get adequate fiber within our diet. Um, you know, taking a fiber supplement like Metamucil can be certainly a, another way to um, get more fiber, but we're not getting as many nutrients as we would if we're actually having the vegetable or actually having the fruit or the whole grain um, with it. So I, I know I sound like a broken record, but <laughs> I'm just really um, a proponent of, of trying to get most of um, those nutrients from whole foods um, versus, you know, in, in a pill um, type of, of form. Is something like cod liver oil like a better source for, you know, something like vitamin C compared to a pill? Is there a difference there? Um, I don't know. I don't really have a lot of people on cod liver oil, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, that might be something that I, I guess, you know, depending on the processing, but again, it's, it's going to have been processed. It's going to, you know, gone through probably some sort of um, factory or manufacturing process. So again, may not be as, you know, absorbed as readily um, as something that if we are actually having the cod itself um, and getting um, the nutrients that way. Okay. And then I think this is the last question um, that we're going to have time for. And I'm not sure if it'd be good for, for Lisa or Prasu, but what are, maybe Prasu would be good for this one. What are some se seasonal veggies coming our way in the winter um, that we can, that we can be expecting sure. or excited about? Yeah. Can, yeah. Well, you know, winter is a, winter is a great time for all the root vegetables that are, uh, are, well, we're actually we're very lucky that we can get so many vegetables year round, but there are particular ones that come up. And maybe it, it's a good time to try some things that you may not have tried before, like turnips or uh, rutabagas or interest, those, once you roast them or any of the ones that we eat all the time, like carrots and sweet potatoes and um, any variety of like 
Brussels sprouts, all these things, I highly encourage you to experiment and, and really go ahead and try different ways of cooking vegetables. My favorite way of cooking vegetables is to roast them. There's no way to get that kind of flavor by a quick saute or boiling or anything like that. And just a little bit of olive oil and you know some, some salt would be all you need, but you can really experiment with a lot of different herbs and spices, which is something I do pretty often. A sheet pan meal with a bunch of roasted vegetables, some kind of, some kind of grain, and then maybe a dressing and just bring everything together that way. Perfect. Sounds delicious. Um, okay, I know that we have a couple more questions that we might not have time to, to get to right now, but I do want to know that um, if we, the ones that we have not answered, Colleen will follow up with you and we can get everybody's questions answered through email. So fear not on that. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to my co chair, Cynthia Miller, and she is going to wrap it up for us. Hi, I'm Cynthia Miller, co-chair for Women's Health Circle. Thank you so much, Lisa and Prasu. Uh, your expertise and your energy for your subjects was really heartwarming to me. Um, and sharing it with our circle of, of friends that are with us today was really fabulous. On behalf of the Women's Health Circle, I do want to say again that we appreciate your energy and your knowledge around the importance of nutrition because as we know, nutrition is helpful not only in our growth, but also in our aging. During these times is another reason that it's, it's wonderful that we can come together today and learn together and share, uh, reach out. I'm sure there will be some uh, behind the scenes messaging going on after this if you were looking at the chat, because uh, some of us can contribute to others' questions as well. <clears throat> This is the last quarter of the year, and it's a time where we have the opportunity to work um, toward helping the Virginia Hospital Center Pediatrics Toy Drive. There you go, there's some pictures there. Uh, <clears throat> each year we collect toys and gift cards to ensure that the youngest of patients uh, get at least one holiday gift that they normally would not receive. This drive is now starting and more information is going to be coming to you after this seminar, after today. And I see that it ends on December the 15th. So it's never too soon to start thinking about either cards or toys that you can bring and bring to the hospital or bring to the drop off points. I'm not, and that will be coming uh, to you. We do appreciate knowing that you're going, I mean, I know you will be supporting this drive. If you would like more information about Virginia Hospital Center or our Women's Health Circle, please leave a private, you can leave a private request in the, the uh, chat room down below, or you can just reach out to virginiahospitalcenter.org and we'll be sure and get you information that, that you need. Again, we thank you so much for being part of this seminar. I really look forward to seeing the contributions and energy that's going to come to the, the toy drive, the Virginia Hospital Center toy drive. And that's it for today. Look forward to seeing you in the future. I send big hugs, virtual hugs to all of you for being here and being part of this presentation. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>